welcome you here to online worship with us here at Village Presbyterian Church. We are honored you have chosen to worship with us this morning. If you are new or are visiting, we are particularly pleased that you found us, and we'd love to know that you are visiting with us. So please don't hesitate to drop us a line and let us know who you are and where you're from. We have a few events coming up this week. The Children and Family Ministries are offering these awesome summer programs. So I invite you to go online to our website, villageprez.org, and register for these programs or find out more information. As is custom for us, we will take a few moments here in this worship time to pass the peace with one another. We may not be able to do it in person by giving a hug or a handshake, but we can do it virtually by sending a text or an email or even picking up the phone. So I invite you in this time to pass the peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Hi, I am Trevor Stone. May the peace of Christ be with you always. We're the youth band. May the peace of Christ be with you. We have found the tomb empty and Easter has come. God's promises are fulfilled and we are living in a time when renewal and redemption are afoot. We gather in light of these truths, not because we ourselves have fully achieved that renewal. We gather because we are in and on the journey. We gather not just because we have been transformed, but because we have faith that in light of Easter, we are in the process of being transformed. Easter is the end of one story and the beginning of another. So let us hear how that story continues this week. Let us worship the God who, in the face of all that is broken, stands with us in our heartbroken moments. The one who delivers transformation to us. The one who makes all things new. Let us worship that God on this day.
here for our little time together. Hey, Pastor Sally is going to talk to us today about a story in the Bible when God promises to make all things new. I don't know about you, but I like new things. You know what my favorite thing to get brand new is? Shoes. I love shoes, so new shoe days are my favorite kind of days. Hey, I asked some friends of mine at Village if they've gotten anything new recently that made them feel really happy. So let's hear what they have to say. When I was five, we got a brand new puppy. She lived on a farm and we had to drive there. And it was a really long way. When we got her, she was only eight weeks old. I love her because she's really cute and soft. And she's really active, so I can always play with her. Um, Something I got as a present was this, like a bunch of blank art canvases. Um, They are really good because you can paint whatever you want on them because they came blank, like white, and so it's really fun. I got this basketball hoop as a gift. I like it because it's big and it's easy for me to shoot. I like to play with it on warm, sunny days. Those are awesome new things. Thanks so much for telling us about them. Hey, did you know that God promises that he's making all things new? What do you think that even means? Well, let's think back to my new shoes. So look at these. I got these around Christmas. I was shopping with my son at a cool shoe store. and We thought they were calling my name. Look at them. So I wear these but I'm pretty careful with them. I don't walk through mud and puddles and stuff like that in them because I love that they still look new. Now let's look at a pair of my old shoes. So look at these. These shoes are a few years old. They used to be awesome running shoes, but now they've become my yard work shoes. They're falling apart. They're muddy and dirty. They're pretty pummeled, right? Well, you know what? Sometimes I feel like these shoes look. I don't know about you, but I get tired and weary and muddy and just worn out. Do you ever feel like that? I think if we're honest, we all feel like that sometimes. But you know what God promises us? He can take us when we feel like these shoes and transform us into these shoes. Not bad, huh? He's making us new from the inside out. God is working in our lives all the time. He's making us more compassionate, more empathetic, more loving, more generous, more like him. And God tells us that he is always working with us to transform us from the inside out. How cool is that? Hey, let's say a little repeat after me prayer together. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, sometimes we feel tired and worn out like old shoes. Thank you for your promise to make all things new. Thank you for transforming us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an awesome day, you guys. I hope it's a new shoe kind of day for you. See you soon. Friends, let us continue our time together in prayer. Surprising and mysterious God, we stand in wonder of who you are and what you do. Whenever we think we have you figured out, you wonderfully remind us that you are bigger and more loving, deeper and more gracious than we can ever imagine. We come with prayer on this day in this Easter season, no longer waiting to celebrate that which is the conquering of life over death, but in awe and celebration and joy at the reality of the first Easter morning so long ago. 
But we do so, God, in the recognition that we are prone to wander. We do so acknowledging that we are too easily drawn into our concerns of the day rather than that of your concerns for your kingdom. When the sounds of Easter celebration fade away and the colorful flowers no longer so fresh, the feelings of joy shared with others hard to find, and loneliness seeming as though it just wells up inside of us. It can feel as though the darkness of cynicism or hate or despondency or apathy are more real than your truths. As though we are still in that tomb with the stone still rolled shut and no hope of anything ever being any different. Gracious God, when those days come, help us to remember. To remember that renewal is not just a true story on the day we celebrate Easter, but that the joys of Easter rewrite and renew what is true on all other days. Hope beyond hope, faith well-placed, new life in the face of death, a guiding light that pierces darkness. And so as we grieve, as we fight depression, as we grapple with diagnoses, as we face fear, as we find renewal in ourselves, as we bring hope and renewal to the lives of those around us, as we seek to place your renewal in the world around us, in all these things, we pray that we would not do so silently, that we would never be silent as we live in this difficult life, difficult, yes, but life that is painted with your resurrection. And so let us lift our voices, praying not only these things, but also the prayer of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now a reading from the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, see, I am making all things new. Also, he says, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Okay, so it happened. Easter 2021 happened just last week. We proclaimed he is risen. We sang Jesus Christ is risen today with all of the alleluias. So do you feel different? Do you feel it? Do you feel transformed? If you watch the Village Church Daily Devotional on Holy Saturday, the Saturday before Easter Sunday, I asked listeners if they were ready ready for God to transform every molecule of this whole world into God's new creation, 
God's new heaven and new earth. I heard from many of you that day that you hoped you were ready. Now we are a week out. And I wonder, do you still feel that same energy? The palpable energy, the anticipation, the hope that this year will be different? This year, you will see how God turned us into God's new creations. This year, humanity will be different. This year, I will be different. This, this is the year that we will live as if there is no more mourning and no more crying. This year will be the end to poverty to racism, to polemic political speech, and death will really be no more? Is this that year? These are questions that Christians from the very beginning have wrestled with. So they would celebrate Christ rising from the grave, and new believers would get baptized into the faith on Easter Sunday. Since around the third century, the week after Easter is the week that new believers to the Christian faith would attend church every day, and each day they would worship, pray, sing, and perhaps most importantly, would learn how to live as Christ's new creations. In addition, Those were who were, I don't know, more mature in their faith, we'll say, would also attend and get a refresher on how to live as Christians. It's a powerful energy of being a new creation. And it's this energy that would permeate the Christian community charging it with the certain knowledge that if God can rise Christ from the grave, then sure enough, sure enough, God can and would change this world and each individual into God's new creation. But you see, just as for those third century Christians and every Christian since then, including us today, God's transforming the new Christians was not like showing up for four-year-old soccer practice when at the end of the season, everyone gets the participation trophy. No, this type of transformation was from the core of one's being, the fabric of one's own understanding of themselves and their worldview was changing. God was transforming them into ones who understood that the truth is that God can and does resurrect Jesus Christ. And therefore, the powers of oppression that restrict us in this world can and will be overturned. The end of the book of Revelation is not talking about God's new heaven and new earth coming without long, hard-fought heartbreak and world-changing work. You see, we are not just Easter Sunday people living in a perpetual Easter Sunday. We are also the people who know good and well Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. We know, we know that God can use betrayal, can use sleeping disciples, and even an instrument of death to change the world into God's new creation. You might be wondering, but how can you be so certain? 
You too hear the news of mass shootings happening. You hear the ways the earth is being scarred. You're right, I'm a pastor of pastoral care. And you know what? You too have told me about your deepest heartbreaks. So you might be wondering how on earth can I stand here and tell you that God still resurrects and that God can and does conquer the power of sin and also has the last word on death. You see, I have stood face to face with the deepest heartbreaks of this world. In fact, I have stood with some of you in those deep heartbreaks. A pastor friend of mine told me a story from this past summer. This was the height of the Black Lives Matter protests from this last summer. A church member called her to inform her that her own support and the church's support of the Black Lives Matter movement was causing that church member both anger and confusion. So the pastor and the church member agreed to meet in person, socially distanced, of course. What, ap- what happened over not just one, but three consecutive con- conversations was a true transformation. You see, it was through thoughtful, honest, and vulnerable discussions that these two were able to discuss not just the issue of race and racism in the world, but also the helpful and hurtful responses of the past, and even potential ways to participate in anti-racism work in real and authentic ways in their own community. These conversations transformed both the pastor and the church member, and even their community into God's new creations. The earth itself can also be continually transformed into God's new earth as well. Author Amy Strauss gives us a glimpse of this. She, along with hundreds of thousands of permaculture practitioners worldwide, are transforming their tiny plots of suburban land into one that produces more than it consumes. So she turned her 10th acre suburban lawn into a fruit and vegetable producing micro farm that supplied enough food to incorporate into half of her family's meals changing not just her own front yard into a fertile food-producing farm, she began to reduce her use of pesticides, reduce food waste, and even trips to the grocery store. And in turn, she increased the microbial life of her soil, the soil tilled, and even attracted diverse pollinators to her yard. And perhaps... Most importantly, supplied fresh fruits and vegetables to her table and to the tables of her neighbors. With each turn of the compost and with each turn of the season, her land is one step closer to the abundance found in God's new earth. Another story ringing in my head for this sermon is the story of Vanessa. 
And you see, this story is one that shows us where sometimes God's creation does not turn out the exact way we expect. I met Vanessa in her ICU room, room A7 in Austin, Texas. She never knew me as, as a chaplain or as a person, at least the way that you and I know each other. When I met her, she had been released from jail just one day prior, and she decided to have just one dose of, of drugs, and she did it. She overdosed. What she didn't know is that if you have been at all clean, then you can't use the same dose you have used before. You must start with a smaller dose. So that ICU room, she had a tube breathing for her and a cap on her head that measured every single electrical pulse that came from her brain. Her family came into that room, and, and they just kept telling me her story over and over and over again of how well she had done in jail. She had really turned her life around. She'd really cleaned up her act, that this was not fair, and they were praying for a miracle. And then it happened. All the tests of many days came in, and this was not going to be the miracle where Vanessa walked out of that ICU room. So her family called the family priest. Fifteen of us crowded in that teeny ICU room while the priest prayed, anointed, and reminded Vanessa and all of us standing there, that the transformation into God's new creation does not always look like the way we want it to look. Sometimes it looks like God standing at a bedside saying, it's okay, come home, I love you, I've always loved you. Now you can be transformed. I've stood with many of you at death's grave, saying in the face of death itself the same alleluias that we sing about on Easter. Even at the grave, we sing our song, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. It's not easy to proclaim the transformation of Easter in the face of the grave of Good Friday. Yet becoming God's new creation is no easy task. You all know this story too. But what we know deep in our bones and what we proclaim year after year and Sunday after Sunday is that it is God who is doing the transforming work. God is the one who raised Jesus from the grave. God really is at work in this world. So what does transformation into God's new creation look like for you? What does it look like in your world? What are you desperately needing God to transform? Perhaps it's a diagnosis, a relationship that desperately needs to find a new path, or maybe your kid your kid is taking your heart to deep and terrifying places. Where is it that God needs to step in and transform in this earth into a new creation? 
Where do you see Good Friday looking for Easter Sunday? Where is it that God is creating a new creation in your life, in this world, and in this community? So the work that is ours to do this day, this Easter season, is to point out to each other all the places that God is transforming this world and this earth into God's new creation. We get to testify to each other, just like I have done with you today, all the ways that God is transforming each of us into God's new heaven and new earth. And God sends us out from this moment right here to tell the good news that Jesus Christ is risen and our whole worldview has changed because of it. Hope truly abounds. God can and does transform even the darkest places of this world into God's new heaven and new earth. So just in case you missed it, alleluia, Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia and amen. To echo Sally, what does this transformation look like for you? You may have an immediate response to that question, and if so, I think we are called, you are called, I am called, we are called to bring about transformation in ways that utilize God's heart for grace and love and mercy and justice. But maybe, maybe like a lot of us, you don't have an immediate response. Maybe when you wonder what transformation could look like, you would rather avoid that, that kind of conversation. And, and, and I'll tell you, I think that's okay. I don't think we all know what that looks like. And so to echo Sally again, becoming God's new creation is no easy task. And so if I could, if you were to, if you were to randomly ask me what I want to eat, I, I don't always know. I don't always know the answer to that. But I do know that if I'm not hungry right now, I will be hungry be, because that's, that's what it is to be human. We are all going to hunger. And so what I fear is, is not that I would hunger. What I fear is that I'd be willing to eat anything when I'm hungry. 
I'd eat anything regardless of whether it's good for me just because it would satisfy the hunger. So I, I also think that we all seek after renewal and transformation, and I think that's part of the human condition. And I think we seek that not just for and of ourselves, but I think we seek it for this world that we have been tasked to care for. And I don't fear that. I don't fear that need for that transformation. In fact, the Easter story might argue that we should celebrate that. What I fear is that I would never pay attention to how I respond to that need for transformation, or that I would be satisfied with any transformation without regard to God's work and desire to partner with me in that. And so if you have an answer to that question, if you, if you know what transformation looks like, and even if you don't, I hope, I hope that at the very least we are all honest with ourselves and that we are in conversation with others about the kind of transformation that might be just what we, and through that, what this world is in need of. And that is a conversation I challenge us all to be having this week. God sends us out from this time of worship together to share the good news that Jesus Christ is risen from the grave, and because of it, our whole world has changed. Hope abounds. And now may the God who chose you, the God who named you, and the God who transforms you bless you this day and all days. Amen.